Chapter 14. A queenless colony is a pitiful and melancholy community. There may be a mournful wail or lament from within. Without intervention, the colony will die. But introduce a new queen, and the most extravagant change takes place. From the queen must die in other affairs of beans and men. So talking about introducing a new queen, that sounds interesting, huh? Um, a lot of vocab words in this little quote, aren't there? Melancholy, mournful, lament, uh, extravagant. Any of those words would work for your um, vocab. After August and I went through the hat box, I drew into myself and stayed there for a while. August and Zach tended to the bees and the honey, but I spent most of my time down by the river alone. I just wanted to keep to myself. The month of August had turned into a griddle where the days just lay there and sizzled. So think of that sentence. The month of August had turned into a griddle where the days just lay there and sizzled. Isn't that some great imagery? It's like bacon sizzling. Very hot, right? I plucked leaves off the elephant ear plants and fanned my face, sat with my bare feet submerged in the trickling water, felt breezes lift off the river surface and sweep over me, and still, everything about me was stunned, stupefied by the heat, everything except my heart. Stupefied, another good vocab word. It sat like an ice sculpture in the center of my chest. What type of figurative language is that? It sat like an ice sculpture in the center of my chest. It's comparison, right? And it's using the word like, so it's comparing the heat, or it's comparing um, her heart to an ice sculpture in the center of her chest. It's a simile, right? Because it's a comparison using like. Nothing could touch it. People in general would rather die than forgive. It's that hard. If God said in plain language, I'm giving you a choice, forgive or die, a lot of people would go ahead and order their coffin. I wrapped my mother's things in the falling apart paper, tucked them back in the hat box, and put the lid on it. Lying on my stomach on the floor, pushing the box under my cot, I found a tiny pile of mouse bones. I scooped them up and washed them in the sink. Every day I carried them around in my pocket and could not imagine why I was doing it. When I woke up in the mornings, my first thought was the hat box. It was almost like my mother herself was hiding under the bed. One night I had to get up and move it to the other side of the room. Then I had to strip off my pillowcase and stuff the box down inside it and tie it closed with one of my hair ribbons. All this just so I could sleep. I would walk to the pink house to use the bathroom and think, my mother sat on the same toilet. And then I would hate myself for thinking it. Who cared where she sat to pee? She hadn't cared a whole lot about my bathroom habits when she abandoned me to Mrs. Watson and Tiri. I gave myself pep talks. Don't think about her. It's over and done. The next minute, I swear to God, I would be picturing her in the pink house or out by the wailing wall, stuffing her burdens among the stones. I would have bet $20 T. Ray's name was squashed into the cracks and crevices out there. Maybe the name Lily was out there too. I wish she'd been smart enough or loving enough to realize everybody has burdens that crush them, only they don't give up their children. In a weird way, I must have loved my little collection of hurts and wounds. They provided me with some real nice sympathy. With the feeling I was exceptional, I was the girl abandoned by her mother. I was the girl who kneeled on grits. What a special case I was. We were deep into mosquito season, so a lot of what I did by the river was swat at them. Sitting in the purple shadows, I pulled out the mouse bones and worked them between my fingers. I stared at things until I seemed to melt right into them. Sometimes I'd forget lunch, and Rosalind would come find me bearing a tomato sandwich. After she left, I'd throw it in the river. At times, I could not prevent myself from lying flat on the ground, pretending I was inside one of those beehive tombs. I felt the same way I did right after May died, only multiplied by a hundred. August had said, I guess you need to grieve a while, a little while, so go ahead and do it. But now that I was doing it, I couldn't seem to stop. 
I knew that August must have explained everything to Zach and June too, because they tiptoed around me like I was a psychiatric case. Maybe I was. Maybe I was the one who belonged on Bull Street, not my mother. At least no one prodded or asked questions or said, for Pete's sake, snap out of it. I wondered how much longer it would be before August had to act on the things I'd told her. Me running away, helping Rosalyn escape, Rosalyn a fugitive. August was giving me time for now, time to be by the river and do what I had to do, the same way she gave herself time after, there after May died, but it wouldn't last forever. It's the peculiar nature of the world to go on spinning, no matter what sort of heartbreak is happening. June set a wedding date, Saturday, October 10th. Neil's brother, an African Methodist Episcopal reverend from Albany, Georgia, was going to marry them in the backyard under the myrtle trees. June laid out all their plans one night at dinner. She would come, down, come walking down an aisle of rose petals, wearing a white rayon suit with frog closings that Mabley was sewing for her. I could not picture frog closings. June drew a picture of one on the tablet, and afterward, I still could not picture them. Linnell had been commissioned to make her a wedding hat, which I thought was very courageous of June. There was no telling what she would end up with on her head. Rosaline offered to bake the wedding cake layers, and Violet and Queenie were going to decorate it with a rainbow theme. Again, all I can say is how brave June was. One afternoon, I went to the kitchen in the middle of the afternoon, nearly dying of thirst, wanting to fill a jug with water and take it back to the river, and found June and August clinging to each other in the middle of the floor. I stood outside the door and watched, even though it was a private moment. June gripped August's back, and her hands trembled. May would have loved this wedding, she said. She must have told me a hundred times I was being stubborn about Neil. Oh, God, August, why didn't I do it sooner while she was still alive? August turned slightly and caught sight of me in the doorway. She held June, who was starting to cry, but she kept her eyes on mine. She said, Regrets don't help anything. You know that. The next day, I actually felt like eating. I wandered in for lunch to find Rosaline wearing a new dress and her hair freshly plaited. She was poking tissues into her bosom for safekeeping. Where did you get that dress? I said. She turned a circle, modeling it, and when I smiled, she turned another one. It was what you would call a tent dress, yards of material falling from her shoulders without benefit of waistband and darts. It had a bright red background with giant white flowers all over it. I could see she was in love with it. August took me into town yesterday and I bought it, she said. I felt startled suddenly by the things that had been going on without me. Your dress is pretty, I lied noticing for the first time there were no lunch fixings anywhere. She smoothed her hands down the front of it, looked at the clock on the stove, and reached for an old white vinyl purse of maize that she'd inherited. You going somewhere, I said. She sure is, said August, stepping into the room, smiling at Rosaleen. I'm going to finish what I started, Rosaleen said, lifting her chin. I'm going to register to vote. My arms dropped by my sides, and my mouth came open. But what about, what about you being, you know? Rosalind squinted at me. What? A, a fugitive from justice, I said. What if they recognize your name? What if you get caught? I cut my eyes over at August. Oh, I don't think there'll be a problem, August said, taking the truck keys off the brass nail by the door. We're going to the voter drive at the Negro High School. But, for heaven's sake, all I'm doing is getting my voter's card, said Rosaline. That's what you said last time, I told her. She ignored that. She strapped May's purse on her arm. A split ran from the handle around onto the side. You want to come, Lily? said August. I did, and I didn't. I looked down at my feet, tanned and bare. I'll just stay here and make some lunch. August lifted her eyebrows. It's nice to see her hungry for a change. They went onto the back porch, down the steps. I followed them to the truck. As Rosaline got in, I said, Don't spit on anybody's shoes, okay? She let out a laugh that made her whole body shake. It looked like all the flowers on her dress were bobbing in a gust of wind. 
I went back inside, boiled two hot dogs, and ate them without buns. Then I headed back to the woods, where I picked a few bachelor buttons that grew wild in the plots of sunshine before getting bored and tossing them away. I sat on the ground, expecting to sink down into, a dark mo- into my dark mood and think about my mother, but the only thoughts I had were for Rosaline. I pictured her standing in a line of people. I could almost see her practicing writing her name, getting it just right, her big moment. Suddenly, I wished I'd gone with them. I wished it more than anything. I wanted to see her face when they handed her her card. I wanted to say, Rosaline, you know what? I'm proud of you. What was I doing sitting out here in the woods? I got up and went inside. Pressing the telephone in the hallway, I had an urge to call Zach to become part of the world again. I dialed his number. When he answered, I said, So, what's new? Who's this? He said. Very funny, I told him. I'm sorry about everything, he said. August told me what happened. Silence floated between us a moment, and then he said, Will you have to go back? You mean to my father? He hesitated. Yeah. The minute he said it, I had the feeling that's exactly what would happen. Everything in my body felt it. I suppose so, I said. I coiled the phone cord around my finger and stared down the hall at the front door. For a few seconds, I was unable to look away, imagining myself leaving through it and not coming back. I'll come to see you, he said, and I wanted to cry. Zach knocking on the door of T. Ray Owen's house. It would never happen. I asked you what was new, remember? I didn't expect anything was, but I needed to change the subject. Well, for starters, I'll be going to the White High School this year. I was speechless. I squeezed the phone in my hand. Are you sure you want to do that? I said. I knew what those places were like. Somebody's got to, he said. Might as well be me. Both of us, it seemed like, were doomed to misery. Rosalind came home a bona fide registered voter in the United States of America. We all sat around that evening waiting to eat dinner while she personally called every one of the daughters on the telephone. I just wanted to tell you I'm a registered voter, she said each time, and there would be a pause and then she'd say, President Johnson and Mr. Hubert Humphrey, that's who. I'm not voting for Mr. Pisswater. She laughed every time, like this was the joke of jokes. She would say, Goldwater, Pisswater, get it? This went on, even after dinner. Just when we'd think she had it out of her system, out of the complete blue, she'd say, I'll be casting my vote for Mr. Johnson. When she finally wound down and said goodnight, I watched her climb the stairs wearing her red and white voter registration dress, and I wished again that I'd been there. Regrets don't help anything, August told June. You know that. I ran up the stairs and grabbed Rosaline from behind, stopping her with one foot poised in the air, searching for the next step. I wrapped my arms around her middle. I love you, I blurted out, not even knowing I was going to say this. That's where we'll stop.